Welcome to part two of the Energy Balance Weight Management and Eating Disorder Lecture Series. Uh, we are going to pick, off, pick up where we left off uh, and talk about treatment of overweight and obesity. In the earlier part of the lecture, we talked about how common overweight and obesity are, especially here in the United States. And so thinking of the best ways to help people um, who would like to lose weight in order to improve their health is really important. And, and as you've probably noticed, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of opinions about the best way to do that. But unfortunately, there's, there's no one solution that helps everybody. Uh, so we're going to go over some of the things that we know are safe uh, for people to consider. So one of the big messages is uh, when you are thinking about losing weight for yourself or you're giving recommendations to someone else, uh, you're in it for the long haul. Uh, a lot of the, the diets out there are very short term. Um, a lot of people can can lose weight, you know, in a few weeks or a few months, but maintaining that has always been the most difficult part. Uh, so thinking about healthy, active lifestyles, and by that, I mean not extreme, something realistic that people will be able to do for the rest of their lives, um, including the lifelong dietary modification. So thinking that you're going to completely eliminate entire food groups uh, forever is probably not realistic. Uh, this is also a really important point when you think about a sound weight loss program, so one that is safe and healthy, uh, you are going to have to control your energy intake. Um, even though what regulates energy balance is very complex, um, at the end of the day, to lose weight, you do have to consume fewer calories than you expend. So helping people do that in a way that is not too extreme, that includes all the essential nutrients that they need, uh, is very important. Um, the other side of, of energy balance is the energy expenditure, and the part that we have the most control over is physical activity. Uh, even without weight loss, physical activity is extremely good for our cardiovascular system and, and help controlling our blood sugar and keeping our blood pressure down. Um, so should always be part of an overall healthy lifestyle. Uh, and and the, probably the trickiest component of all of this is control of problem behaviors. Uh, so people can go on diets, people can exercise, but true lifelong uh, behavior change um, is, it can be really difficult. So a successful weight loss program, um, when we consider it successful, is when those involved remain at or are close to a lower weight. Um, you know, even within that definition, there's a lot of ambiguity. So only about 5% of people following a commercial diet program succeed in the long run, which means that they don't work for about 95% of people, which is a really disappointing number. Um, typically about one third of weight that is lost in a program is regained within three to five years. So again, that staying power um, tends to be the most difficult part of, of any weight loss program. Um, so what can happen to a lot of people is that they lose weight, gain weight, lose weight, gain weight. Uh, so we call that weight cycling. Uh, and sometimes going down and going back up is, is almost as bad as, as just staying at a higher weight. Um, the negative consequences of weight cycling include increased upper body fat, and we know that that's the less healthy kind that causes um, more heart disease and other things like that. Certainly very difficult on someone's self-esteem and their, their psychological health. Um, it declines the HDL cholesterol, that's the good one that we actually want to be high, uh, and it can decline your immune system function, so make you less able to fight off diseases. Um, out of all of the, the things out there that people have done to lose weight, the only obesity treatment that routinely shows long-term success is actually weight loss surgery. 
Um, and I don't know if you know a lot about that or not. Um, I actually do know quite a bit about it. I worked in that field for quite a few years. Um, it's certainly not for everybody. Uh, but if, if your health is compromised and the, the benefits of the surgery outweigh the risks to your health, um, as of now, it, it is the best option that we have for people. A lot of times when people are trying to lose weight and control their energy intake or control their calorie intake, um, they figure out how many calories they, they want to eat. Uh, so a couple of sort of factoids and, and things that go into the math as you figure that out. Uh, the first fact is that adipose tissue contains 3,500 calories per pound. So if you think about that, you have to, um, you have to expend 3,500 calories less than what you need to maintain your weight in order to lose one pound. 3,500 calories equals one pound. It's not fun math if you're trying to lose weight. Um, now, no one's going to deficit 3,500 calorie pound. 3,500 calories in one day. So we usually divide it out by a week. So to lose one pound a week, your energy intake must be decreased by 500 calories a day or physical activity increased. So you're expending 500 extra calories a day or a successful combination of, of both of those, right? But if you take 500 times seven, that's how you get to that magic number of 3,500 to lose one pound. Um, now, the other not so fun part of the math is, you know, if you're subtracting 500 calories a day, but you're only eating, you know, for an average size woman, maybe around 1,500, well, that puts you down to about a thousand calories a day. That's, that's very low. You actually can't even get all your nutrients in on that low of amount. Um, so women, usually the lowest we would ever recommend uh, without medical supervision would be 1200 calories a day. Um, and depending on sort of your, your calories you need to maintain your weight, um, there might not be a huge difference. Uh, for men, we usually don't recommend lower than 1,500 calories a day. So, so how do you do that? How do you cut out 500 calories a day safely? Um, and again, that seems like a lot, uh, but we're only predicting about a pound a week for that 500 calories a day. Um, a lot of people really sort of focus on low energy density to be the most successful long-term uh, in terms of dietary changes. Uh, so you think about low energy dense foods, right? They don't have a lot of calories uh, per pound of the food. So we're really talking about fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, high fiber foods um, that you can eat a lot of so you get a good volume of food, but they don't provide a lot of energy or calories. So the other end of the equation for energy balance is expenditure. So if you expend about 100 to 300 calories per day extra above normal activity, that's also going to help you get to your weight loss goals. Uh, so keep in mind, your, your body is, to maintain your weight, is sort of used to your normal activity level. So this has to be above and beyond. Um, duration and regular performance are keys to success. Uh, a lot of times people can start a physical activity routine, but they don't find something that's uh, enjoyable and that can fit into their life for the long term, and that's really critical. Um, also highly recommend resistance exercise. So that's like strength training, weight training. Uh, you don't necessarily expend a lot of energy or burn a lot of calories but it does help change your body composition. So as you increase your lean body tissue or your muscle, that's gonna drive up your metabolic rate at least a little bit, um, so can help with, with um, weight maintenance more long-term. Uh, 
Uh, if you look at table 10.5 below, it's talking about how many calories um, per kilogram of body weight you burn per hour. So let's see, let's find my favorite. I really like to roller skate, but I don't get to do that very often. Um, what I do most often is run or jog. Um, I can go a little bit faster than 10 miles an hour, but um, I burn about um, 13.2 kilograms per hour. So I have to figure out my body weight in kilograms. Um, I didn't plan for this, so I'm not doing that math in my head. Uh, but it's it's fairly straightforward if you want to do it. There's also a lot of apps and things online where you can figure it out. Um, the, the main point is, of course, the higher the intensity, the more calories you burn per hour. I'm uh, better off jogging than roller skating. All right, so the last part of the Accessible Weight Management Program is control of problem behaviors. Um, this was always my favorite part of helping people with their weight loss goals because, um, you know, this is, if you can help people with this, you can start to really talk about long-term success. So we have many, many different strategies. Um, I'm just giving you a snippet and a brief description of them. Uh, keep in mind in the real world, if, if you are working on people, working with people on this, uh, you don't just change a habit overnight. Uh, you don't just change a habit in three months or whatever crazy statistics people cite. You know, this is a lifelong commitment that usually requires a lot of support. Um, and there's many, many ways to help people think about this so they can really change their behaviors. Um, I would say in practice, I have used all of these. Um, and even with using all of them and, and working with people on all of them, it's still uh, really difficult. So the first one listed here is chain breaking, and you can kind of see that in the picture. If you start at the beginning of the change, um, the beginning behavior, um, it's, it's leading up to all the different things that might um, end up with someone eating cheesecake at night. Um, and this is a very common problem, not necessarily cheesecake, uh, but snacking at night after dinner. So if you think about it, you know, this is, um, you know, a chain of events. So maybe you have a perfectly good ample dinner that, that probably was plenty of calories or energy um, and you could physiologically be done eating, but then it's your downtime, you get comfortable, you turn on, you know, a lousy TV show, uh, let's just say bachelorette, right? What's lousier than that? Um, you start to feel a little bored because it's a lousy TV show. So you need something to do, something to stay awake. It's too early for bed. Um, you go to the kitchen, you start nosing around. There's leftover cheesecake. You're not hungry, but it looks good and you're going to have to eat it sometime. Uh, you feel guilty and then that guilt, that negative feeling uh, actually makes you want to eat more, right? So there's a lot of variations on that same theme. Uh, but I used to do this with patients all the time. We'd, we'd kind of, you know, think about their terminal behavior, their end habit. And then if you trace back all the things that lead up to it, um, you have to start coming up with strategies so you, you break the chain. Um, so the most logical and sometimes easy place to break the chain is, you know, if you really like cheesecake and you're eating it when you're not hungry, don't buy the cheesecake, right? Rocket science. Uh, but it, talking it through really helps people sort of come up with, with strategies that are realistic for them. Um, that's actually also an example of, of stimulus control. So thinking about your environment, um, what stimulates you to eat, especially eat things that you're not necessarily hungry for? Um, can you not resist cheesecake? Is, is that something that uh, you just love so much? If it's there, you're going to eat it. Um, do you eat more when you're sitting in front of the television? Um, do you eat more when you're studying for finals? You know, different things like that. Um, cognitive restructuring is very difficult. Um, 
you know, you, you also hear of this in uh, people who study psychology, uh, but a lot of people have a lot of um, negative frame of minds regarding eating. Uh, even in this example where we're talking about feeling guilty, um, and that in itself is a trigger for more eating. So um, kind of, I used to call them, you know, voices in your head. Uh, when people have some of these thoughts that tend to sabotage them, helping them recognize them and trying to replace some of the negative thoughts with more positive ones can be very helpful. Uh, contingency management, um, I used to always do with people when things were going well, because always in life, you're going to be faced with challenges. You know, maybe you're exercising, you're eating great, and you feel awesome. Well, what happens when, you know, a massive virus hits and you're stuck at home and you don't have much to do and you're stressed out, right? No one could really anticipate having to prepare for something crazy like that, but there's always something. There's always a vacation. There's always a holiday. Um, there's always stress. So when that happens, what are you going to do with, about it? What's your contingency plan? Uh, and the last one I, I used with just about everybody, some form of self-monitoring. Um, you know, the tricky thing about eating and exercise, especially eating, is, is you really have to do it every day, multiple times a day. Uh, so it's easy to just kind of forget or overlook. Um, so being careful about monitoring either what you're eating or when you're eating, why you're eating, how you feel while you're eating, uh, how much exercise you're doing, uh, even your body weight. Um, sometimes that backfires for some people, but, um, you know, making sure that you're aware of behaviors on a daily basis will help you change those behaviors. A little bit of data and research on what do people do when they are able to lose weight and maintain it. So behaviors for successful maintainers. Um, you know, this you have to be flexible with all of these, but the the longest term research on this um, shows that successful maintainers tend to eat a low fat, high carb diet. Uh, which might shock some of you because that seems to be the opposite of what most people are doing right now. Um, I don't think it's so much like how much fat or how much carbs, uh, but I think having low energy dense foods like fruits, vegetables, and whole grains um, that can fill you up um, but not add on so many calories seems to be a useful strategy for a lot of people. Um, the other one might surprise you too. A lot of people really endorse um, fasting or intermittent fasting. Um, and there's a lot of data that shows that people who eat breakfast actually do better managing their weight. Um, starting off getting your metabolism going in the morning um, and not letting yourself to get too hungry and overeat later in the day. Um, I already mentioned self-monitoring on the previous slide, but uh, people who maintain their weight still self-monitor themselves even after they've lost weight. Uh, and a lot of people still at least loosely track their food intake. Um, and then physical activity. Successful uh, maintainers are physically active. Um, there's a lot of physiological reasons why that activity helps maintain the weight loss. And being active for about an hour a day seems to be really important in keeping off weight once you've lost it. So I've already dropped a couple of things, uh, intermittent fasting and keto. Um, I, would, uh, I would call those fad diets. Uh, some of you might want to argue with me about that because certainly some people do find success on them. Um, but, you know, the truth of the matter is if there was an easy way to do this, we wouldn't have the problem in this country that we do. So it, it is absolutely not easy to lose weight and maintain it. Um, so if something promises you uh, a quick fix, um, you know, they show you some research that's very 
basic or just based on one study or a small study, um, if they're telling you to do something that nobody else is telling you to do, they're, they're making it very black and white, good versus bad. Um, if it's associated with a product, there's all kinds of shakes and supplements. Um, if they are showing you these dramatic before and after pictures, um, if they're using their own studies um, that they did themselves, um, if they're sort of telling you that, that this one thing is going to work for everybody and are ignoring differences among individuals or groups, um, those are all red flags. Uh, number three that's highlighted and underlined is probably the most important one to remember. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Um, so again, if it were easy, we'd all be doing it. It's not easy. Let me go over some of the more um, common ones that have popped up over the years. Um, Adkins, Duke and Diet, Scarsdale Diet, these are all low carb. Um, so metabolically, when you restrict carbohydrates, you keep your carbohydrates low, uh, you're not gonna make glycogen, right? If you don't have carbohydrates, you're not gonna store carbohydrate, carbohydrates as glycogen. Um, and glycogen holds on to a lot of water. So these low carb diets usually produce a nice initial weight loss, um, not fat loss. Water is very heavy too. So when you lose water, um, it seems like things are going well, but you don't exactly know what you're losing. Um, you are forcing your liver to produce glucose via gluconeogenesis, right? If you're not getting carbohydrates in your diet, um, your body has to find a way to make glucose. Otherwise there's no fuel, no ATP. Um, so you your body can do gluconeogenesis, making um, glucose from um, protein sources, uh, which is probably not what you want. You want to lose fat, not muscle. Um, the amount of weight that is lost and improvements to health are no greater than other types of diets. Um, so this has been, these diets have been around forever and they've been studied extensively uh, they do tend to produce um, better short-term weight loss than other diets, but if you look at anything over time, um, they don't hold up over time better than anything else. Uh, a lot of times when you restrict carbohydrates, you um, also uh, eat more protein, and if it's animal protein, uh, you can start to raise your cholesterol. So um, you really have to be cautious about these um, this is the, the diet examples from your book. Um, right now, um, the most popular low carb diet is the keto diet. Uh, when I was your age, everybody did low fat. Um, the Pritkin diet was very popular. That was uh, very, very low fat. Um, I have multiple copies of this book, Eat More, Way Less. Um, cause if you, you know, fat's nine calories a gram. So obviously if you are cutting out fat, you can cut calories. You just can't make up for it by eating even more carbohydrates. Um, so the low fat diets are about five to 10% of energy from fat. Um, it's not harmful. You're not going to get a deficiency, but, um, it's boring. Fat tastes good and it adds a lot of variety. Um, so most people just you know, can't keep it up forever, uh, even though it might have um, better nutrition than some of the others that we would talk about. It's all kinds of novelty diets. Um, this is, you know, listing three of them. There's way more than this, and most of them are completely crazy. Um, they, they'll always claim that they have found some type of magic bullet. Uh, they'll they'll jump on the bandwagon and emphasize a single food or food group. Um, grape, I mean, there's an entire grapefruit diet, not too hard to follow, right? But can't keep on it for very long. Um, they've had diets that have been mostly rice and mostly eggs, um, obviously not very maintainable. Um, the rationale is that you get bored with foods because you're eating the same thing, so you don't eat that much anymore. But most people end up 
uh, completely abandoning the diet. Um, a lot of times these novelty diets do have you buy supplements or shakes or something like that um, that are often quite expensive um, and don't work in the long run. So from a, a clinical perspective, um, who's the best person to go to? Where do you get professional help if, if you want to um, get some help with weight control or weight management? Uh, it says here doctors are the first professional to see for weight control. Um, certainly you'd want to know if there's a medical reason why you might be struggling with your weight and they could assess that. Um, if, you, if you are going to do more lifestyle behavior um, type of things for weight control, a registered dietitian uh, would be what I would recommend. I'm obviously very biased about that. Uh, but, you know, the, we're very well trained in, in this area. We understand food composition. Uh, we're also trained in behavior change and some of those psychological aspects as well. Um, so I think we're pretty good at our jobs. Um, and I always advocate working with other experts like an exercise specialist, an exercise physiologist, um, who can, can not only give you advice about the best types of physical activity, but also um, think about what's safe for, for you. There are drugs out there for weight loss. Uh, a lot of people are really skeptical of them because they do have side effects. Uh, many of the drugs enhance norepinephrine and serotonin activity in the brain. Uh, so these are neurotransmitters that, um, that help reduce hunger. Um, so they, they make you have fewer cravings. Um, so you don't feel like eating as much. They usually make you feel fuller. So you're more satisfied with your food. Um, they also have drugs that are similar to amphetamines, so they're going to kind of jazz you up, um, prolong epinephrine and norepinephrine activity. Um, not only does that make you feel less hungry, it also increases your metabolism a little bit. Um, they have, these are kind of crazy ones, um, drugs that inhibit lipase, so you can recognize lipase as an enzyme that helps digest fat. Uh, so if you don't digest fat, you end up um, excreting it in the toilet. Um, so the idea is that you're not getting those calories. Uh, the side effects are kind of gross. Uh, you can kind of imagine what they are based on what I just told you. So they have not been very popular. Um, and then another way that, that people are um, prescribing weight loss medications is um, some drugs that aren't for weight loss have weight loss as a side effect. Uh, so antidepressants, it's a very broad category. Some antidepressants actually make you gain weight, uh, but there's a few like Wellbutrin is a popular one um, that sometimes it, it actually stunts your appetite. So um, it can help people lose a little bit of weight. I think I've talked a little bit about um, very low calorie diets. This is a picture of Optifast, which is a protein shake that's commercially available. Uh, so by very low calorie, I mean about 400 to 800 calories a day. That's uh, typically mostly liquid. So you're sort of getting the bare bones of nutrition in order to survive. Uh, because of that, you do should be under medical supervision. Um, it should be associated with a long-term program because obviously you're not going to have shakes forever uh, and you need to you know kind of transition back to normal eating without gaining back any weight that you've lost which which can be very challenging um, and then the last option is gastroplasty this is weight loss surgery uh, it makes most of them make your stomach um, smaller or at least the capacity to hold food is smaller uh, sometimes we also bypass part of the intestine. Um, so there's, there's a couple different options that I'll show you here on the next slide. Uh, so the, the first one, if you look at, that's your stomach. That's what most people's looks like, attached to the esophagus and the intestine. 
Um, so gastroplasty um, is anything that we're doing to the stomach. So the least invasive is gastric banding or lat band. Uh, this isn't like a real surgery. There's no cutting or stitching. They actually insert uh, a foreign object, um, a band around your stomach, uh, and it's connected to the port. You can kind of see it uh, connected to that white thing. Um, and when the surgeon uh, puts that band in, they can inject the port with saline, which, which makes the band tighter. So think about putting a, a rubber band around the top of your stomach like that. Uh, when you eat, uh, the food sort of backs up in that first part before the band and goes through the band very slowly, especially if it's very tight. Uh, so you will feel fuller, um, longer, and you'll fill up sooner with the lap band, which can help some people lose weight. Um, the gastric bypass is the next one shown there. That one's been around the longest. Uh, if you see those, that staple line there, this one is more surgical. Um, they do put a staple line in. They actually um, end up removing um, the stomach or separating, I should say. So the food comes through the esophagus, it goes through um, that first part of the stomach, and then they've taken the small intestine and they've actually had to move it up and attach it. So your stomach pouch uh, that's connected to the esophagus, that's now your new stomach. And it bypasses that, that large unused portion of the stomach and goes right to your small intestine that's been reattached. Uh, so your stomach's now about the size of an egg. Um, this also changes a lot of the hormones that control appetite. So people who have the surgery usually don't have nearly the same hunger as they did before, uh, and they fill up a lot sooner. Uh, the kind of latest and the greatest that, that I've been seeing a lot more of is that last one called the gastric sleeve. Uh, for this one, the removed portion of the stomach that's kind of shown in white does get totally removed. Uh, so your stomach is now, looks more like a sleeve. It's long and narrow, kind of almost looks like a banana. Um, no part of the intestine gets changed. It's so attached where it was always attached. So it's a, a little bit of a safer surgery because you're not messing with the intestine, but your, your stomach is still a lot smaller. Um, it does change the hormones, uh, so it's actually very similar to a gastric bypass. So at the other end of the spectrum, um, people often need professional help for weight control if they need to gain weight. Uh, in some ways, having a, a low BMI is actually more dangerous than having a high BMI. Um, for, for a woman um, that can severely alter her hormones and she'll stop menstruating or stop getting her periods. Um, this is also changing her hormones so she can lose bone mass. Um, anyone, male or female, will lose bone mass if they lose weight too quickly. Um, it makes you, you know, less likely to recover from illness. It can make it more difficult to recover from surgery and more difficult to become pregnant. Oh, excuse me. Um, certainly not recommended for young people who are still growing and um, people can actually die if, if their body weight drops to too low of a, a level. Um, so we, we help people gain weight the same way we help people lose weight. We usually aim for about 500 calories a day, uh, but this time extra. Um, and in order to get that 500 calories without totally filling somebody up, you want energy dense foods that are, that are gonna be higher in fat. Um, and also making sure that someone's not too physically active because if, if you're burning it all off, uh, you're not gonna be able to gain weight. And one of the, the groups of people who, who have to think about this um, are people with eating disorders. So disordered eating is broadly defined as mild, short-term changes in eating patterns 
Uh, sometimes people have disordered eating because they're under a lot of stress, or they've not been healthy, they're ill. Um, maybe they're, they're trying to lose weight and modify their diet on purpose. Um, disordered eating may lead to changes in body weight and nutritional problems. Um, and if it's mild and short term, it rarely requires professional attention. So this is sort of the, the first step. Um, it can lead to more disordered eating and become worse. Um, but if it, if it doesn't last, then um, it's just considered disordered eating. Uh, eating disorder is the more severe distortion of the eating process. This is very dangerous, can be life-threatening. Um, we do sometimes consider overeating as an eating disorder, but for the rest of this lecture, we're going to talk about um, the under eating, the anorexia, the bulimia. Um, we'll talk a little bit about other categories, which is binge eating and eating disorders not otherwise specified. Uh, spend a little time comparing anorexia with bulimia. Um, even just by glancing at the pictures, you can see that there's a physical difference. Um, anorexia tends to be the most damaging physiologically because this is um, really extreme under eating all of the time. So when you don't have enough energy or calories, um, your hair will start to fall out, you'll bruise very easily from nutrient deficiencies, you're more likely to faint and be tired, you don't have body fat so you can't control your body temperature, um, your metabolic rate's going to drop. Uh, you're you're going to start using your body proteins, including your heart uh, tissue, um, for energy. Um, more stress on your muscles. You'll also decrease your muscle mass. Um, you'll have bone loss. You'll be more likely to have fractures. Um, your hormone levels will drop, and you'll stop getting your periods. Um, you're not going to have a lot of fat, body fat, or bone mass. Plan you go is um, you start to get little fine hairs all over your body. Um, I used to be a, a long distance runner in college and unfortunately I knew quite a few people with eating disorders and one of the ways you could see it on someone is it almost looked like they had um, like a beard. It wasn't usually dark. Um, and you had to look close, but that's what Lanugo is. Uh, and that is because your body's starting to grow hair to try and keep your, yourself warm um, because you don't have enough body fat to do that. Um, symptoms of bulimia. Bulimia is when you, you are eating, uh, but you're also purging, which is the, the more the dangerous part of the disease. Um, if you're purging by making yourself vomit, you'll start to get swollen sal salivary glands. Uh, your esophagus will get more irritated, uh, more likely to have stomach ulcers. Um, the, the symptoms of both, that's the middle part shown in green. Um, your potassium, which is a really important electrolyte, will, can get off balance, which can be very dangerous. Um, dental decay, iron deficiency is very common. Uh, low white blood cell counts, so the immune infection is going to be compromised in constipation. Um, another point I'm going to make is we always tend to talk about women. They are more likely to have eating disorders, but I also um, have known at least two men who've, who've had it, and it's harder to recognize because you don't expect it, but um, they also experience uh, dangerous symptoms and side effects from the disease. So as I just said, it, it is more common in females, um, and it's really far too common altogether. About 5% of women in North America will have anorexia or bulimia. Um, and I'll also say uh, college age is, is often a very prime time for eating disorders. We seem to be very susceptible uh, to that during this time. So it's important to talk about in this class. Uh, what else makes someone more susceptible? Genetics, so a lot of this does run in families. Um, a lot of times there's 
other things that go along with it, uh, including depression, substance abuse, or anxiety. Um, there can be physical reasons. Um, I've known a, a few women who developed eating disorders, um, and previously they might have been overweight. So kind of starting on that dieting and, and not being able to stop. Uh, many eating disorders do in fact start with a simple diet and sometimes at, at really young ages um, when people maybe don't have the, the best judgment or education about this. Um, and then a lot of times being on a diet helps people feel in control um, and then the dieting itself gets out of control. Um, you know, if, if you're on a diet and then you have another trigger like stress or dysfunctional family or drug abuse, uh, that's when the dieting can get out of control. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but, but this is much more common during adolescence and early adulthood, which is what uh, many college age people would be considered early adults. Uh, and without treatment, serious health complications can occur. So heart conditions, um, usually if someone does die from an eating disorder, it is because of damage to the heart. It can also cause your kidneys to, to fail. Um, and of course, both of those things can be fatal. So it's, it's not something to take lightly. Anorexia. Um, is a little bit easier to spot, uh, extreme weight loss. Um, and then the psychological aspect is even though someone with anorexia is very thin, um, they'll have a distorted body image. So they won't, they won't think that they're thin uh, and they will have a very strong irrational fear of obesity or weight gain. Um, so the prevalence is one out of about every 200 adolescent girls. Um, lots of reasons for that. Uh, one of the things among adolescents is they are going through their puberty and growth spurts and body composition changes uh, and puberty is hard enough as it is. Um, so that can be a very strong trigger. Um, men account for about 10% of anorexia cases. Uh, both men that I knew that had an eating disorder had anorexia. Um, and actually both of the men I knew were, were athletes. Um, and so I think um, trying very hard to, to be perfect and, and have a perfect body and um, went over to the point where it was an eating disorder. Um, although not necessary, a common thread in many cases of anorexia is conflict in the family structure um, again, I, I mentioned perfection, having these extremely high expectations, which are unrealistic and unhealthy, um, can, can be causal. Uh, Self-worth is evaluated in terms of self-control. So if I control my food and not eat, and not have my favorite things and, and keep my body weight at a certain level, um, that, that tends to make people have more self-worth and feel good about themselves. Uh, even though uh, if you don't have an eating disorder, you'd recognize that as, as not healthy at all. Um, and again, anorexia is, is usually um, very, very thin skin and bone appearance. I actually already went over this in another slide, so I'm not going to read it to you again, but here's the, the bullet list of what happens to someone or what can happen to someone with anorexia. Um, and, and some of these are extremely dangerous. Uh, treatment is multidisciplinary. So anorexia is a complex disease. Um, there'll be medical problems that a physician needs to help with. Um, there's, there's nutrition problems, even in terms of um, when you go to gain weight, uh, you have to do that carefully. Um, you can hurt someone if, if you try to overfeed them too quickly. Um, certainly psychology, because there are uh, a lot of mental health um, problems and behaviors um, that you have to help people with. The ideal setting is a medical center, 
um, especially if weight falls below 75% um, because there are some dangerous physical risks. Um, average time for recovery is seven years. So this is, this is not something that just goes away. Um, this is a very long-term recovery that requires a lot of help and support. Um, for many people, it, it's not a one-shot deal. Um, people will have relapses. Um, so, so you really need um, good support and good programming. In terms of nutrition, obviously you want to have enough energy or calories to minimize or stop the weight loss, uh, get that metabolic rate back to normal with a consistent intake of food, help people go back to, to normal food habits. Um, if you do have to gain weight, um, you're going to have to have quite a bit of calorie density. Um, and that can, three to 4,000 calories can help you gain about two to three pounds a week. Uh, a lot of times you, there will be nutrient deficiencies, so supplements will be recommended. Um, and then helping people with a, a healthier attitude towards food. You know, food's not the enemy, food is healthy. Um, and teaching new habits, so eating when you're hungry um, and not stopping until you feel satisfied. In terms of the more psychological aspects of, of treatment, teaching people to accept a healthy body weight, um, have them feel in control of their life um, with you know, controlling things other than just food, um, helping people cope with tough situations, so alternative ways to cope besides restricting eating, uh, and a lot of times family therapy. Um, not only because sometimes family members may have been part of the problem, um, certainly they want to be supportive and, and help someone with recovery. So bulimia is another type of uh, fairly common eating disorder. Bulimia is binge eating, so eating a lot at once, followed by attempts to purge excess energy. Uh, so purging, we usually think of as vomiting, and that's the most common, but people also purge by taking laxatives, diuretics, enemas, which is like a laxative, or excessive exercise. Um, so the binging is usually when someone's having stress or a problem, um, and they'll, they'll eat a lot in a short amount of time. Um, they'll recognize the behavior as abnormal. They'll and feel guilty about it, and that's when the purging happens. Uh, binge eating is about half the time also um, associated with depression for the person. Binge eating is harder to spot. Uh, people can often hide both the binging and the purging, so it's not very obvious. Uh, usually people don't look very much different. Um, so it's not that same skin and bones most of the time as you might see with anorexia. Um, more often in females than males. Um, and usually, you know, because you can hide it uh, very well, um, successful, highly functional. Um, so not something you might expect. There is some overlap, so about a third of individuals with anorexia do cross over to bulimia. Um, going from bulimia to anorexia is um, less likely. One of the other common things with bulimia is the person will have kind of elaborate food rules. Um, can't do this, can't do that. If I do this, I have to do that. And if one of the rules gets broken, that can trigger a binge. Um, lots of things can trigger binges, including hunger, so it's a physiological feeling, uh, stress, boredom, loneliness, depression. Um, if you've ever seen anybody doing this, um, you can see it online. Um, you know, it's, it's not even like they're enjoying the food. It's, it's usually eaten very, very quickly, um, kind of that out of control. And then 
And the most common time for, for a binge is at night. Um, so they're not interrupted and, and certainly doing it in secret. Um, a binge can be anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours. The most common thing someone would eat would be sweet, high carb foods. That tends to be easy to purge if, if someone uses vomiting as a purging. Uh, and one of the other characteristics of the binge is it's fast. It's also a lot of calories at once. Um, and then because the person doesn't want to have all those calories, that's why the purge happens. Um, if if somebody vomits, um, some of the energy is still absorbed. Um, if an enema is used, um, less of it is, um, or more of it actually is absorbed, right? So if you get the food out while it's still in the stomach versus the, the in large intestine um, will depend on how much you absorb. Uh, binging and purging often triggers negative feelings like guilt and depression. Um, over time, bulimics experience low self-esteem and feel hopeless. They'll likely gradually distance themselves from others. Um, they don't want people to know they're binging and purging, but they become to kind of rely on those behaviors. So that's just showing it as a, as a cycle. Um, and when I show it this way, you can kind of imagine what the treatment's going to be, right? You have to help people break this cycle, just like the chain breaking we talked about earlier with the weight loss treatments. Uh, the physical effects will depend somewhat on you know, what someone's doing to, to purge um, you know, especially vomiting because some stomach acid comes up, it can damage your teeth and your esophagus and your stomach and cause swelling. Um, especially if you're using the laxatives or enemas, it can affect the, your gut health and make you become more um, constipated. Ipic syrup is, is something people sometimes use and it's not meant to be used in high amounts. It can damage your heart, liver and kidneys. So in terms of nutrition therapy, you know, if you want to break the, the binge purge cycle, you want people eating on a more regular schedule, um, having a healthier attitude about food. Um, we do often use self-monitoring in the treatment um, and really sort of making people aware of what triggers a binge. So often having people keep a journal uh, and talk about what you know, triggers them to eat and how they feel when they eat and how they feel when they're hungry or full. Um, identify some of those thoughts that go along with the binging and purging. The psychological help is going to help patients um, with self-acceptance, um, get away from that all or none thinking, you know, binging and purging are complete opposites. And sometimes that black and white or all or none thinking can can drive behaviors, um, helping people cope with stress. So binging and purging is sometimes how people deal with stress. So finding alternates to that um, and helping them with depression and self-doubt um, can be helpful. So we've, we've already kind of talked about what binging looks like, frequent, rapid, a lot of food, uncomfortably full, um, hiding it because of embarrassment. Um, obesity and binging are not necessarily linked. Uh, most people who have bulimia, again, are normal to maybe slightly above normal, but not necessarily obese. Um, dieting, so kind of getting into these cycles at a young age, um, may be a risk factor or precursor, as is stress, depression, or anxiety. So binge eating will often require professional help, just like, um, oh, geez. I'm so sorry, I switched over, I didn't even notice it. Um, so if this was talking about binge eating, 
um, binge eating is binging without purging. So the binge part is exactly the same, um, but someone is not purging after. Um, binge eating disorder is, is also often treated with professional help. It's very similar to treating someone with bulimia because you're trying to stop the binge, um, helping someone identify um, why they're binging. Um, a lot of times this is done in a group setting. Binge eating is more common than, than the other eating disorders. Um, and sometimes we use antidepressants as part of the therapy. Uh, let's see, so eating disorders otherwise specified. So sometimes you can have disordered eating and it's not, um, doesn't fit the exact criteria of anorexia or bulimia. Um, so that's when we have this other category. Uh, we, we diagnose people through asking them questions uh, and they are included in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders or the DSM. Um, this is something most often used by psychologists. Um, recently, um, binge eating disorder um, became its own disorder. It's not in the otherwise specified category um, that you can, if you're interested, kind of see the different things that, that people might do that fit within this category. Um, so even if it's not a, a, its own disorder, it's, it's still something that um, someone might need treatment for. So we're almost to the end here. Uh, prevention of eating disorders. Um, I'm sure some of you know someone who has an eating disorder or someone that you're worried about. Uh, like most things, prevention um, is helpful because um, you know, the earlier you can catch something, the more you can help someone. Uh, restrictive dieting, meal skipping, and fasting um, are, are disordered eating that can turn into eating disorders. So uh, finding healthier ways to, to lose weight. Um, starting young, um, so establishing good habits with kids. Uh, only eat when you're hungry and stop when you're full. Uh, good nutrition, regular activity. Family meals can help uh, making sure kids understand what's going to happen during puberty because the body does change quite a bit. Um, correct misconceptions, especially some of the crazy stuff that, that younger people can find online. Um, really being careful about weight related comments. Um, they're very hurtful and, and I think people say them because they think they're going to be helpful, but they're not. Uh, not caring so much about the number on the scale, thinking more about um, health, overall health, um, rather than an exact number. Um, helping people with self-acceptance, self-esteem. Um, a lot of athletes, especially if, if a certain body weight is coveted, um, can be very susceptible and making sure coaches know how to talk to athletes, especially in gymnastics lately, there's been a lot of criticism of that. Um, people who can be good athletes in all types of body shapes, um, even getting into diversity, emotional things, um, you know, all part of, of good physical health and good mental health. Uh, and that is it for this slide set. Thank you for listening.